Before civilization, before our ancestors painted on cave walls, human beings told stories. Stories about what happened. But just as often, stories that were told determined what will happen. Today, not much has changed. We might have swapped the word storytelling or fancy words like narrative or paradigm. But in the end, storytelling is one of the first human inventions and it's still the operating principle for how we understand and interact with the world. Who gets to tell the story creates the world. The current story we are told is, our ancestors' lives were a constant struggle. They struggled against starvation, diseases, predators, and most importantly, each other. Only the strongest, smartest, most anxious and most ruthless of our ancestors survived to pass on their genes. And even these lucky ones lived only to the age of 35 or so. Then, about 10,000 years ago, something unusual happened. Some forgotten genius invented agriculture and saved our species from living like wild animals. We went from animal desperation into abundance, leisure, sophistication and culture. Despite ups and downs, things have been getting better ever since. This story, the narrative of perpetual progress, NPP, has become a faith of some sort. A religious dogma, if you will, that when challenged, invites the wrath of the true believers. The NPP tries to convince us that today is better than yesterday and that tomorrow will be better than today. That we are slowly evolving towards a destiny so majestic that the sorrows and pains of civilization can be ignored. In the end, the true believers claim it will all be worth it. But somehow, this golden future we have been working towards for the past thousands of years, strangely, never seems to materialize. As Freud said back in the 1920s, men are beginning to perceive that all this newly won power over space and time, this conquest of the forces of nature, this fulfillment of age-old longings, has not increased the amount of pleasure they can obtain in life, has not made them feel happier. Implicit in the perpetual progress story is the philosophy of Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes called life before the invention of the state as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Was Hobbes right? Was life for human beings really that harsh, cruel and short before civilization came along to save the day? We can either blindly believe the current story, civilization is humankind's greatest accomplishment. Progress is undeniable. You are lucky to be alive here now. Any doubt, despair or disappointment you feel is your own fault. Get over it, shake it off, take a pill and stop complaining. Or we can examine how our ancestors actually lived by looking closely at evolutionary biology, archaeology, first contact reports, and anthropological research. We know through research that for the past several hundred thousand years, our human ancestors looked like us, were as smart as we are, and lived in complex, deeply intimate social groups. We know they didn't eat grain-based diets, but rather, depending on the location, a diet of meat, vegetables, seeds, nuts, and fruits. They lived as hunter-gatherers, constantly on the move, hunting, foraging, therefore physically active. Out of necessity, they created deep bonds with others to maximize their chances of survival. Let's face it, a human being on its own isn't a very impressive animal. We aren't as strong or as fast as other animals, nor do we have any natural weapons at our disposal like claws or big sharp teeth. But put a bunch of us together with collectively made weapons and we can take down the biggest mammoth. This is how we, as a species, have lived for 95% of our existence. Only recently, about 10,000 years ago, which is relatively insignificant in evolutionary time, we would switch to agriculture. This switch has brought an end to how our species has lived for hundreds and thousands of years.
Supporters of the status quo might hear this and think, well, that's perhaps how our human ancestors had lived for hundreds and thousands of years. But for us, modern 21st century techno sapiens, it is unnecessary. Modern life just provides us with plentiful opportunities for peace, entertainment, and meaning. Spending most of our time like our ancestors did on physical activity, bonding, sharing moments, and building relationships, and eating healthy foods sounds like a lot of work. Come on, who wants to be physically active? Isn't it better to have a desk job from 9 to 5? Spending a lot of time making friends and maintaining relationships? No, that is unnecessary. It is a complete waste of time. A better way to get our social needs met is through individualism and social media. Oh wait, health professionals like doctors and psychologists recommend physical activity, intimacy, and a healthy diet for mental and physical health. So I guess our ancestors weren't as clueless as the civilized world wants us to believe. But you might think to yourself, that might be true. But what about the constant violence amongst hunter-gatherers? Competition for scarce fertile lands? What about infections and diseases? Animals attacking and eating humans? Surely civilization has saved us from these disasters? Let's address these objections one by one. Objection number one. Nature is cruel. We should fear her. She's not our friend. She is against us. Nature's so-called cruelty is never shown more prominently than in wildlife documentaries. We have all seen scenes like this on TV before. Music representing danger starts playing as an animal. In this case, a seal is unsuspectedly going about her day. A great white shark slowly moves in. As the predator gets closer and closer, the video slows down. After a long foreplay of horror porn, the great white shark finally emerges from the depths of the ocean and rips the cute seal apart. Nature strikes again is the story we're told. The question then is, are these heavily edited scenes a fair representation of the seal's life and death? When we take a closer look, it quickly becomes clear that the actual death of the seal was a matter of a few seconds. Then why, you might think to yourself, is the video edited in such a way that the actual death and suffering of the seal gets slowed down 40 times? Not 10, not 20, but 40 times. Simple, because it is the only way to highlight the few seconds of suffering the seal had to endure before a quick death. Let's forget about the cute seal's quick death for a second. How did the life of that seal look in general before her death? When you look up how seals live, they don't seem so anxious to me, but instead happy. They spend most of their time chilling on warm rocks and playing around with other seals in the water. They do this for about 30 years on average. Even if she died in the prime of her life, let's say at 15 or 20 years of age, the ratio of pleasure to pain in her life was better than what most of us can expect. I know death can be scary, but pondering how to die is important. Isn't a big part of a quality life a quality death? Can we honestly say that we civilized human beings will have a better death than this seal? Most of us, when we're old, will spend a considerable amount of time hooked up on machines, lingering on for years in discomfort and pain, suffering from chronic diseases that tremendously hamper our quality of life, not able to hold our bladder and sphincter, we shit and pee our pants as we meet death. So all things considered, how cruel was this cute little seal's death? Does dying a quick, swift death without suffering for long periods really sound that bad? Consider the modern alternatives. Retirement homes, cancer, type 2 diabetes, dementia, heart disease, depression, anxiety, high blood pressure, strokes, and dialysis for kidney failure. Medication that keeps us alive, but lowers our quality of life through side effects. For the record, it is obvious that not all deaths in nature take a few seconds. But even when it's not relatively fast, while a lot of the time it is, 
there are other mechanisms that nature uses to calm down the suffering of the soon-to-be-dead when death is brought upon by physical attack. Hey, thank you for watching the video. That's it for now. In the next video, we'll pick up where we have left off by discussing more objections to how our ancestors used to live.